Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. We're going to talk about how to restore broken character. How to restore broken character. In other words, how do you come back after your character has been fractured? I'm going to focus on understanding the process of leadership restoration. And this is probably one of the most difficult experiences leaders have because we've been trained only to succeed. We've never been trained on how to fail effectively. And I think that's the problem. You have to learn how to fail also and what to do with failure. And there has been perhaps only 2% of leaders who came back and survived. I was watching television before I went to bed last night. I was watching the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation channel. And the top story for 30 minutes was the mayor of Toronto who was filmed high on cocaine. I mean, they got the video. They also brought out more news that they film him with prostitutes. <laughs> they brought him before the Council of Counselors in Toronto yesterday. They grilled him for almost four hours. And every single moment of that four hours, he refused to submit. His last statement was, no matter what you do, I'm not stepping down. The vote for him to step down was 41 to 2. He still said, I am not stepping down. They asked him a question. Did you purchase drugs in the last 30 days. He paused for a moment and then he said, yes. They asked him another question. Do you still hold to zero toleration on drugs and guns? He said, yes. Question, does this apply to you? He said, yes. I'm confused. I'm going to talk to you about a word you need to learn. It's the word disqualified. Write it down. You can be disqualified as a leader. This mayor is disqualified. And he refuses to do the honorable thing. Finally, they asked him a question. Have you told us everything that we should know? He paused for a minute. He said, well, there may be another hanger in my closet. I am convinced he has moved from stupidity, landed on foolishness, and have entered dementation. But it shows you the caliber of leaders we have today. Toronto is one of the most beautiful, powerful cities in the world. And the leader is a drug addict. No character. What do you do when you lose it all? I 
have a chapter in the book. The title of it is How to Fall Up. Because we know how to fall down. I have lost respect for so many ministers in America. And I've also lost respect for those who continue to entertain them. I have disassociated myself with organizations in the United States. Even though they wanted me to be used for their promotion, I said to them, because you support those who are disqualified, I don't want to be named among them. How do you fall up? So I'm going to give you what I call the secret to leaders' failure and restoration. Because some of you may have that in your future. Some of you may be there already and have come to this summit to try and get help. You are in the right place. And this goes for politicians and pastors and corporate executives, and bishops, and housewives, and ministers, and even parents. How do you come back after you fail your children? Let's talk about it for a minute. Uh, we learned a few things in this summit so far. I'll repeat a couple of them. One, the foundation of leadership is what? Character. Number two, the most important component of leadership is character. I think you are convinced of that now. It's not power or skill or authority. It's not competence. It's not influence. It's character. Number three, the greatest protection of leadership is character. The greatest protection of leadership is character. You are not protected by your entourage. Because your entourage may not have character. Or they may be the ones who are protecting you from your default character. They are part of your corruption. And number four, talents and gifts are only as safe as your character. Character is the container of your skills, your gifts, and your talents. It's the container. If you break the container, you lose your talent and gifts. I mentioned to you about law yesterday, and I'm going to give you something very quick about law. We understood that the foundation of character is values which produce your morals. But the question is, what produces values? The answer is, write it down, the foundation of ethics is law. And law is the source of culture. Law is the source of morality. Law produces moral implications, all law. And written and, uns uh, written and spoken law, rather, feeds the conscience. We talked about that yesterday. Conscience is unspoken law. It's the law shouting at you. And law is the source of values. Law interprets values and law establishes values. Whenever you create a law, you've identified a value. And this is why the first thing you need to build any nation is not a prime minister or a president. You need a constitution. The constitution contains the ideals of the country, the standards that they are, are going to live by. It incorporates and constitutes the, the philosophy of the people. It is the body of law by which we agree to live by which means that the Constitution is the source of culture. So that's how powerful law is. I thought I would give you a couple of thoughts about how law affects culture, and then 
how you can protect yourself from falling by getting back to law. Character is manifested when your values, your principles, and your morals are tested. No matter what you tell me about your character, only tests can prove what it is. You can call it tests a lot of things. You can call it temptation. You can call it opportunities. But your character is tested under pressure. Number two, character is manifested under pressure because you don't believe what you believe until you are tested to break it. Your convictions are proven by tests. Not by your pronouncements. What you claim must be tested. And that's why you shouldn't just read a person's resume. Read their life. You'll be amazed how many people embellish their resumes. After all, who would write bad things about themselves? So never be impressed by people's resumes. I want to stress again then that character is manifested when self-sacrifice becomes more important than popular compromise. Who you are is always tested by two things. Write them down. Matter of fact, three things. Three things will test your character every time. And if you study... And in my book on character, I did a complete assessment of this with the greatest leader that ever lived, Jesus Christ. The three things that will always test your character, he passed the test. First one is appetites, which includes food, drink, and sex. The second test that will manifest your character is the test for fame. And the third one is the test for power. They say, if you want to know who a man or woman really is, give them power and money. See what they do with it. Mr. Speaker, please. So it's so important for you to understand that you are going to be tested. Now, I want to ask you to please do something legally. You can take your iPhone and photograph this page. Because I won't give you time to write them all, but these are important. I want to just give you a list of what I call the power values. We will read them together. Are you ready? Number one, values are better than rules. Number two, values are more important than rules. Number three, values outlive goals. Number four, Values send a message. Number five, values must be identified. Number six, values must be accepted if they're going to work. Number seven, values must be believed. Number eight, your values shape the organization and the nation. Number nine, values are personal, but they are never private. Number ten, Values become a culture. Number 11, your values must be shared. Number 12, values attract like values. Hmm. Number 13, values become social norms. And number 14, values can create or destroy. I just want to comment on number 12 values attract like values what do we mean by that whatever your value system is becomes a magnet and it attracts people just like those values values also repel values I mentioned the first day you came here in my session, the first time, first day I said, if someone approaches you to break law, 
or to do a corrupt act in your business or in your ministry or your workplace, if they approach you to break a law, you are already a failure. Because somehow in their minds, they believe that you would actually do it. They actually, in other words, your values were not loud enough. You should wear your values loudly so that people will even tell other people, don't even bother him. He's not going to go for that. I know the guy. So if evil men approach you to do evil, you are already defective. Your values should speak loud. Let's talk about the values of leadership. Write them down. The value of faithfulness. The value of self-control. The value of steadiness. The value of integrity toward those you serve. The value of responsible communication. The value of personal integrity. This is an important list. The value of maturity. The value of humility. These are the values of leaders. Each one of these is a seminar. So I have a lot of work to do before I die. Because each one of these are so important, you need to teach each one of them for two hours. Because that's how much we lack in leadership. The values that a leader needs to embrace and keep close are so critical to that leader's protection. Now, pardon me for moving too quickly because I want to get to the heart of this in a short time. What is the impact of a leader's failure? What is the impact of a leader's failure? Write this down. Failing in leadership is not as great as failing to deal with that failure effectively. I repeat. Failure in leadership is not as great as failing to deal with the failure effectively. Everybody fails in something. Everybody have experienced the disappointment in themselves. Everybody has embarrassed themselves and others. Everybody has done something that have, have made them feel depressed because their expectations fell below their own standard. That's not the problem. The problem is not the failure. It's how you deal with that failure. And I can say from experience, most leaders I have encountered don't know how to handle failure. I'm going to give you some specific instructions on how to do it. Not just for yourself, but to help other people. Second point, failure in leadership is really the closing of an account of trust. People close the account. When you fail, the people shut down the account. What account? The account of trust. Remember, you cannot pay for trust, pray for trust, or buy trust, nor can you demand it. It is something that people deposit on your account of integrity, the more they get to know you. Every time they prove your character, they make a deposit. And you can build up a deposit of trust for 50 years. The only problem is if you violate the, the account, what took you 50 years to build can be lost in 50 seconds. And that's the tragedy of failure. At least the point number three. Trust is the currency of leadership, and it is the reason why a leader is successful. It's not your personality, it's not your power, it is not your oratory skills, it's not your ability to influence people, it's not your position, it's not your money or your clout. The key to your leadership is trust. People follow you because they trust you. You violate that you lose the account. So you are as safe as the account you protect. What are you doing right now that's threatening your account? What are you secretly doing that could cancel your account? 
the mayor of Toronto, <laughs> when they first exposed him, the police exposed him, he denied everything. And then the police showed the video. I wonder if there's a video on you. You have no idea how the satellites work anymore. <laughs> I was talking to the minister of security in Israel. Israel has the number one security component in the world. He said this to me. He said, if you take your battery out of your iPhone, we still hear every word you say. He didn't say turn it off. If you take the battery out. Yes, take a deep breath. So you thought you were safe, huh? After that moment, I trembled. So unplugging doesn't unplug. That's my point. So live in a way that you don't care what they hear. Clap. So if the currency of leadership is trust, then you can only buy leadership success with the trust people give you. Your number one goal in life as a leader is to protect the account. We need help, don't we? Let's talk a little bit then about the power of leadership trust. Write this down, very important. It is impossible to lead those who do not trust you. Because they will sabotage you. You'll be amazed what they're cooking up when you leave the office. Secondly, trust is a deposit on the leadership account by the followers over a long period of time. I defined trust for you earlier in the seminar. I, I told you that trust is an equation. The equation is test over time equals trust. Can you write it just like that? Test, draw a line, over time, put equal, trust. Which means that trust requires two things. Testing a person over a long period of time. Then that's how you build trust in that person. That's why you cannot stand up before an audience ever again and say, trust me. Stop using the term, it's impossible. Either they trust you, or they don't. And that depends on how long they were able to observe you under pressure, consistency, integrity, candor, wisdom, surviving battles, attacks, criticism. You trust people who survive. That's why we trust Mr. Nelson Mandela. His name has come up so often throughout the world lately because he is trustworthy. He is worthy of trust because he's kept steady under pressure. His com conviction was bigger than their attempts to make him compromise. See this picture? I like this picture. I think we need more leaders in this position. You can interpret this picture many ways. One, fear of failure. Oh God, please, don't let me disappoint the people. Don't let me disappoint my spouse. Don't let me disgrace my children. Cry out. This is my position every day. I'm like, I'm so afraid. You think it's joy to be up here. You think it is easy for you to shake my hand and tell me how wonderful I've helped you. That's not easy. 
You're putting pressure on me. You're telling me, don't mess up. A lot of people pursue leadership. I have no idea what leadership is. Cry out. Go home and make that your position every day. Every morning you wake up. Every evening you say, oh, please, please God, don't let me mess up. I have a uh, little private philosophy I live with. Here it is. Before I make a decision, I always ask myself, will I enjoy remembering this? If the answer is no, you don't do it. Leadership. Let's talk about the leadership account one more time. The account of a leader is maintained by the leader's continual faithfulness and protection of that trust. No one maintains the trust account. Only you. So hiring an entourage and bodyguards can't help you with trust. As a matter of fact, it, it's possible that you need bodyguards because you lack trust. Sometimes you don't see people with entourage because they are important. It's because they are afraid. Not afraid of you. Afraid of themselves. You are the only one who can protect that account. And that account is protected in secret and public, constantly. You got to protect it in the dark when no one's watching. The mayor of Toronto, can I go back to him again? This guy thought no one knew. His account is over. I don't care how much he tries, and he's making the wrong decision. I wish he's watching this right now. Brother, just step down. You are disqualified. Do you know that the American runner who ran the race, the Bahamas came second. A few months ago, the Olympic Committee called our government and said the Bahamas came first. <laughs> Hang on. They said because they discovered that the American runner took drugs. In other words, the winner lost. You can be fired and still be on the job. If you don't believe me, ask Saul. <laughs> God can fire you and people think you are still hired. He was still going to work and was fired. And the guy who was appointed to take his place was already appointed. I hope there's no one already appointed in your position. Because God knows some things about you. Protect your account. I told you and I warned you, this is a tough session. Because this brings the weight on you to protect your character. Write this down, please. The leader protects the trust account with his integrity or her integrity and their character. You protect that account by your being fixed, predictable, unmovable, set. I will not violate my values. I will not sell my convictions. I got to protect my account. This man have lost his account. 
He's still trying to get it back. And the chess is so tough. He's trying to help the poor, try to help Haiti, trying to do good works. He never went the route of restoration. Pretending that it didn't happen doesn't cancel it. Read out loud, please. Read. Violation of the trust account by a self-imposed destruction of this integrity and character cannot be restored merely by forgiveness. See, I got you. Stop telling people, forgive me. The mayor of Toronto last night repeated it over and again. Uh, uh, okay, yes, I was caught. Forgive me. I want the people of Toronto to forgive me. I want the council to forgive me. I want the Senate to forgive me. Brother, we don't want to forgive you. We want you to leave, they said. Wow. Forgiveness is not restoration. The request for forgiveness is you saying, I need help. Give me room. Give me space to get help. Read this one for me. Go. The followers may forgive the leader immediately, but the trust account will be depleted. Don't confuse forgiveness with the restoration of trust. You know, when you commit adultery in your marriage, hmm, you, you know, you feel all bad about it, remorse, all this good stuff, you know, and you get on, on your knees, oh, please forgive me, baby, you know, I just, you know, it just was a mistake, you know, and I didn't mean I love you. <laughs> After all, you're a Christian, you got to forgive, you know, God say forgive, and go through all this stuff. And you finally get your spouse to say, okay, I forgive you. That has nothing to do with the account. Forgiveness is not the restoration of trust. Write it down. Forgiveness is simply me saying, I'm going to give you room to rebuild the account. I have heard it said many times when I counsel couples, they say, you know, it's, it's been a year now since I committed adultery and my wife's still bringing it up. Listen, brother, the account is still empty because when you go in the night, she still ain't sure where you went. You need an ankle brace <laughs> that takes photographs that she can see. Oh, I'm talking sense here. You know, you just got to say, forgive me. No, brother. Why are you late? I mean, the questions they ask you are all trust questions. Why, why did you come home late? Stop blaming people for not trusting you. You destroyed the account. And I learned something through my experience with people. It takes longer to rebuild it and to destroy it. And it takes longer to rebuild it than to build it. Take a deep breath. You need, a, you need some air. Leaders trust account. Read this one for me. Go. The leader must be constantly aware that a trust account, which may have been built over 30 or 40 years, could be canceled in 30 or 40 seconds. And that's why the leader... He refused to step down. He can't believe it collapsed that quickly. You know, the mayor of Toronto, here we go again. He said, I, I helped to reduce the, 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 the uh, what do you call it, the, the debt of the city. I built roads. I, I, I built bridges. I, he, got a long, he bought all the papers and things he did. He missed the point. We don't care. I built this church. I'm the one who founded this church and I labored in this church and I took 30 years. I built. Brother, there's no trust on the account. It's gone in 30 seconds. 30 years, gone in 30 seconds. Get it? 
It's gone. So I warn you on this last day, don't you take a chance with your account. We need to stop failing and start succeeding. We need leaders emerging in this century and hopefully a twilight can help in some small way to produce a crop of leaders who the world will be shocked over. Who are these people? Where did they come from? They are faithful to their spouses. They don't steal. They don't lie. They don't corrupt themselves. They would rather go to prison. They would rather lose friends. They would rather, rather even lose the church for the sake of their convictions. Oh, give us these leaders, oh God. Read this for me. Go. The leader who has failed cannot expect the account to be reestablished as a result of his remorse, confession, or repentance. None of these restore the account. I'm sure you've seen the great leaders stand on TV, tears running down their faces. <laughs> Forgive me. I'm so sorry. Listen, the account is gone, though. We appreciate your tears. We love you. Hallelujah. But go home. Go get restored. Go get repaired. When your car breaks down, you don't leave it in the highway. Why? It can cause accidents. Get off the road. Go to the mechanic. Get out of the pulpit. Get out of the CEO position. Get out of the office. Get out. You're blocking the highway of people who are trying to make a difference. Write this down, please. It may take longer to restore the account than it originally took to build it. So protect the account. The work is too hard to restore. So let's talk about falling up before we close. Falling up. How to fail successfully. It's a paradox. How to fail successfully. It, 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 there's a way to do it. And that's why I have it in the book. Please get that book and buy 10 copies and give it to all your leaders. I'm telling you. So that they can, first of all, you need to put the fear back in them. The, the first, can I give you a little secret? You want to hear it? I discovered God's first criteria for leadership. The first one. Everywhere God chose a leader, he gave a criteria, a list of them. But the first one was always fear. Did you know that? The first criteria of leadership is fear. He said, choose one who fears God. I don't care about his personality, academic achievement, his skills, his power to speak, communication. He said, forget it. If he doesn't fear, his character will destroy not just him, but the organization. You must be afraid. Don't ever trust yourself. That's why you need accountability networks around you. That's why a Twyla is here. You know, our guys on our team will tell you, we, we are very nice people, but we don't put up with foolishness. We will call you out. You know, there are trustees in this room who will tell you, their wife called me and said, my husband needs input right now. And I called him up and said, look, brother, get your act together. You want to be a part of this circle? We are your examples. The wounds of a friend are faithful. Enemies protect your faults. You call them friends. A friend doesn't protect your fault. They expose it. They tell you, you got to fix this. Why? Because 
you are affecting all of us. When you fail, you close the account. Leaders protect the trust account with their character. Now, I want you to look at this guy. This is the image of someone who has fallen. What do I do? What is the process of getting back? I'm going to give you the list. Write it down. Here's what to do if your character fails. These are the steps you should take. They are fail-proof, but you've got to follow them. And they are hard. <laughs> this is why most of the leaders who fell don't want to do them. But if you follow them, you'll come back stronger than when you fell. What do you do when you fall? Number one, admission of your need for help. That's tough. On the news last night, they asked the mayor of Toronto, do you, matter of fact, check it, go on the internet. They said, do you believe you are a drug addict? Absolutely no. Do you believe you have problems with alcohol? Absolutely no. Do you believe you need help? Absolutely no. I said, this guy is over. I heard such great teaching here this week. I am so inspired. And someone said this week, I wrote it down. It was Sister Josephine. She said, if the person on the ground keeps their hand to themselves, you can't help them. To reach your hand to somebody, who refuse to take it, you can't help them. Restoration does not begin with the restorer. Write that down. Man. Stop asking people, why didn't you come help me? This is not about me. I didn't fall. You can't help a man who doesn't want it. Or, worse still, who doesn't think he needs it. I know your mind is on people right now. I know you, I know you think it's something right now. I know you know, and you know what I'm saying is true. They keep on trucking as if nothing happened. That's why you should abandon them. Paul, the apostle, says, leave them. He says, get rid of them. Don't associate with them anymore. He said, leave them. He says, remove them from among your company. Wow, that's tough. Aren't you supposed to love? Yeah, I love you so much to keep you in this organization to infect it. You are an infection. Number two, confession of your violation of the trust. You must confess that you violated the trust. I learned a lesson. I, I, that stuck in my head. 1975, I was at All Roberts University as missions director. Young guy. And I was responsible for uh, sending the students out. And myself and my colleague... Gary McIntosh, who is a pastor today, uh, we were kind of working together. And the, the students were, would put their monies in for the trips every summer, and we were responsible for accounting for those monies. And I made a mistake in the accounting. And the money didn't add up. I was so distraught, I didn't know what to do. And our boss... Leslie was in, Leslie worked with me, Leslie there. Our boss was Bob Stamps. He was the chaplain. And I had to report to him. And I said, sir, I don't know what happened. And he just lost it. He said, what do you mean? This is the, ch the kids' monies. 
you are about to put me in problems. And he shouted at me. He said, go and fix it. And I began to explain why I did or what happened. He taught me, he said, shut up and fix it. And then he said these words, don't ever justify why you did something wrong. That was, you know, that's deep. 1975, I can still hear his voice. He says, if you attempt to justify it, you are not sorry you did it. Why? You are explaining why it happened, which means you justified wrong. There's no justification for wrong. I walked out of his office, went back to my dorm. I, I, I cried the whole day. I didn't go to class. I, I, was, I was messed up. That was 75. I am standing here over 30 years later, and it's still in my spirit. He taught me a lesson of integrity. When you fail, don't explain why. That's the point. Just confess it and admit it. Take responsibility for it. Don't explain why you sinned. Maybe that's why David came back, you know. David said, God, against you and only you have I sinned. I was born in iniquity, shaped in it. My sins are always before me. I have sinned. Restore the bones that are broken. Purge me with his up. And he made it public. He wrote it in a book. Would you write your disgrace in a book? No wonder why he came back and died with dignity and gave the world a great son named Solomon. Number three. You must identify a true and reliable authority in your life to be accountable to. That's tough. We heard that all week. It's tough to find that person. These words are very carefully written. <laughs> a true and reliable. It's tough to find a true person. Genuine and reliable. That means they themselves have a strong character that's been tested. Thirdly, after that, you should completely submit to that authority without condition. Oh boy. Ladies and gentlemen, the authority that I'm talking about is not your friend. You know, I may be friendly to you, but I ain't your friend. If you, you tell me I'm your authority, I'm not your friend. I'm friendly. But don't get carried away. I will lay into you like a hawk. Don't put no conditions on the submission. You know, I, I, I don't, there's so many names floating in my head that I know personally. They say, they say things like, yes, uh, 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 I, 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 I'd like to meet with you, but uh, uh, let's, let, let's do it next month. I'm like, who fell, me or you? I am available on Thursday. You submit it to me, you find your way, fly, come by boat, train, or fly on a crane. You come here Thursday. You, are a, you got a problem, not me. Well, I, you know, I, I, I got some appointments to keep, they say. They give me conditions. Number five, obedience to the advice and the counsel and the instruction of that authority without condition. This is tough. 
So that means if they tell you, I want you to step down from your position for a year while we help you be restored, you have to literally go before the organization and say, look, my authority said I must step down for a year. I am going to see you next year. Sometimes they say, you got to sit down for two years. Sometimes they say, it's over. Go find yourself another job. The damage is so great that you cannot come back to this specific position. Are you willing to follow instruction to be restored? The next one is even worse. Accept responsibility for all the failure and you must agree never to attempt to defend yourself or your act of indiscretion. Don't ever stand up after you have fallen and try to explain it to people. I'm giving you something very important here. Because you are disqualified to speak. You lost your authority. So what do you do then if you want the people to understand? It leads to number eight. You must allow the authority to represent you to the greater community. Let them speak on your behalf. Because they still have authority with the people. You know, when Peter messed up, Peter denied Jesus. You remember that? I could imagine the other 11 guys were excited. You know, they finally got Peter. You know, maybe they got a chance to become the favorite. Did you read how Peter was restored? Did you recognize who restored him? <laughs> when there was a meeting called, the final board meeting, everyone was sure Peter ain't coming to this meeting. And if Peter had shown up, they would have attacked him. They would have attacked him. But it was the skill of the leader. The leader said, tell my students to meet me and make sure I say, Peter, come. Now, once the authority calls the guy back, it's over. But we like to call ourselves back. We stand there before the people, explain to them, well, you know, I, yes, I did have some indiscretion. Brother, leave. Everybody's weak, you know. Shut up. You are disqualified from speaking. Everybody got weakness, you know. You are disqualified from speaking. Your safety under failure is your authority. What did I say? Please write this down. When you fall, run for cover. Don't run for explanation. Run for cover. Shut your mouth. You are disqualified. This is why when you go to God, you cannot go in your own name. You are disqualified. So he said, don't ever go to the authority in your name. Your name is no good. Oh, man. Is this good? Number 10. Sorry, number 9. Total submission to the disqualified to the discretion of the authority with regard to your readiness to return to public service. Now, this one is important. That means the authority has total control of the discretion as to when it thinks you are ready to come back. This is very dangerous. I've seen people come as well, you know, I went to counseling and you know, I've been there for six months and, you know, and, and, and the Lord told me to start again. 
Shut up, man. You, you, you ain't never going to come back. You can't bring yourself back. Say it. Say it loud. No, louder. I can't hear you. Shout it. Don't you ever forget that. You cannot bring yourself back after a fall. The authority have to bring you back. And the authority controls when that happens. That's why people never come back. They just kind of walk back. They're not sent back. When the authority brings you back, then the followers' respect for the authority begins to restore the trust account. Because the, the, the followers don't trust you anymore. They trust the authority. You got to rebuild the trust. So they got to trust the person who you trust. So they can start restoring your account. In other words, the followers think, if he trusts him again, then we will begin to trust him again. Remember, you can't demand trust. All right, last one. Permanent establishment of a relationship with the authority for ongoing accountability is necessary. That means never again for the rest of your life will you be without accountability again. You will have to report for the rest of your life to an accountable authority. That is to protect you and the people you influence. That's how you come back. When people don't trust you anymore, they trust the ones you trust. And as long as the ones you trust trust you, they will put trust in you. That's why we can be trusted, you know, because God trusts Jesus. He doesn't even want to know your name because it might remind him of your past life. So he said, keep using my son's name for the rest of your life. All right, closure. There you are. Do you feel it? I feel it. Don't you feel it? Help me come back. You can come back after a fall, but you got to follow the instructions. Uh, the two books I want to recommend to you, the new one, in the, the last chapter is about falling up. Please, read it and teach it to your staff. Send it to people who messed up so they can realize that they're not doing the right thing to repair the damage. The second book is called Becoming a Leader. I dealt with it in that book as well. I've restored a few people, even folks in our own church who fell. Same process, and it works. Saved marriages after disaster. Because they went through the process. I've had children who stood before the congregation and said, I want to thank Pastor Miles for allowing me to trust my father again. If it wasn't for him, I would never trust my father again. I've heard kids say that publicly in the front of a congregation. They followed the process. I know it's tough. But you are damaged. You need repair, not a band aid. Finally, failure is not determination of the leader's call. That's good news, eh? Failure is not determination of your assignment or even your gifts. 
You still have your gifts. Your talents don't leave you in a failure. Failure must be seen as a detour. It's, a, it's an interruption in your life. It's even an attempt to cancel destiny. You can get back on course. Your destiny is not canceled by failure. It's canceled by your inability to deal with failure effectively. So if you have fallen down in life, character destroyed, it's time for you to fall up and seek restoration. And this is why we are here at this summit. Not just to teach you how to develop character. Not just to teach you how to protect it. But how to restore it if you lose it. Because there is life after the fall. Thank you very much. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.